Um, well, I've got the most difficult job of all, um, left to the last minute. Uh, I'm conscious that I'm the only thing that stands between you and lunch, which is always a dangerous moment in any conference. <laughs> um, I'm also conscious that we've, we've had three days of discussion, which I have to say has ranged over a very, very wide uh, number of topics. We've talked a lot about politics today, um, and I want to try and draw us back a little bit to where we started on the, on the first afternoon. Uh, but politics clearly matters because I expected to be talking to you today after Brexit, after the United Kingdom had finally agreed to, uh, to leave Europe. It hasn't, I'm very pleased to say, uh, yet left Europe. It may never, in fact, in the end. Um, and I worry a little bit that the Brexit revolution might be our next date following the three dates behind us, uh, that there might be a, a substantial reordering as a result of the absence of Britain from uh, the European Union. But uh, that's not what I want to talk about um, today. I want to take us back to where we started on, on the first day, because we were looking at these three dates and looking at them in, in terms of um, Europe's memory culture or remembrance culture, I should say, since remembrance and memory are not quite, of course, the same thing. They are closely related. I want, us to, I want to bring us back to those three dates. Uh, on the first day, we commented, I think, that the three dates, you know, it's quite difficult to have turning points. Uh, I, I, I'm a little reluctant to use turning points. But these are quite clearly three symbolic dates, um, which is why they've been chosen. They are a kind of metaphor for the big changes that took place in the course of the, uh, of the last century. Uh, I think if we're, we're looking at uh, the last century of change, of course, there are many other ways in which we might look at it. We could look at it in terms of economic systems. Uh, we could look at it in terms of uh, shifts in culture, which have been very substantial. Uh, we could look at it in terms of social transformation, which for much of Europe has also been uh, exceptional in the course of the last century. But none of those changes fit very well into our format of 1919, 1945, 1989, and today. Uh, and I'm not going to labour that point. But it is just a reminder that the European experience is a, is a much broader and more complex experience, perhaps, been suggested uh, by these geopolitical dates. But these geopolitical dates are important, of course, for the network because they are really about war, totalitarianism, and genocide. And those are the three things which this network really focuses on in terms of, uh, of European memory. And because it's about those three things, war, totalitarianism, or the, well, the consequences of war, I should say, totalitarianism and genocide, uh, it inevitably involves Central and Eastern Europe much more than it involves much of the, of the rest of Europe, because it's Eastern and Central Europe that experience all three of those things full-blown in the course of the 20th century. Now, in an interview I gave on, on Monday, one of the questions I was asked, uh, is there a common European memory related, I suppose, to these three dates and to these three topics? Um, and I want to come back to that because it's an issue that's been raised, obviously, in, in, in earlier symposia for the network. Uh, the answer, of course, is that it's very difficult to establish a common European memory. Uh, at a superficial level, of course, the Europeans all know about 1919, the end of the Second World War, they all know about 1989. In that sense, that's not the sense in which we're talking about a, a common memory. We're really talking about a uh, shared narrative. But the narratives aren't shared. We've heard this morning, we've heard on other occasions, that there is a big gulf between the experience of Central and Eastern Europe uh, up until 1989 and indeed beyond. If we compare it with Western Europe or Southern Europe, Europe, of course, is, is not just uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, a narrative of the last hundred years written in Sweden, for example, would look very different from any other narrative one might imagine. A narrative written in Britain looks very different too, because although Britain was involved in 1919 and in 1945, not much in 1989, despite what we heard about Margaret Thatcher, um, 
Britain's narrative from that period is, is on the whole quite different. It's more triumphalist and more positive, I think, than uh, most other narratives are likely to be. And then we have the problem, when we look at national narratives and think about how we might integrate them, many national narratives are, are themselves deeply divided. Uh, I don't need to remind you about the, the conflicts that go on, well, have gone on in France, of course, as well, uh, over the Second World War, resistance, petanism, and so on, over the war in Algeria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in most European countries, there are divisions about what we mean by the national narrative. What is the acceptable national narrative? The exception, I think, being Britain, where we have a much more consensual national narrative, perhaps rather obvious reasons. So to come back to the question I'm, I was asked, is there a common European um, memory from the century that we're talking about? Uh, I, I think the answer is no, at the moment there isn't, but this is a network dedicated to try and find, to try and find ways in which we might be able to establish some kind of common memory, forge links, establish uh, a, 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 a model for reconciliation. Now, in my final comments, I want to really come back to what it seems to me is central to the network and central to the issues we've been talking about, totalitarianism, war and genocide, rather than uh, modern politics, which we've heard a lot about this morning. Um, and the first thing is about remembrance. What do we mean by remembrance? And I, I think that... that um, I, I would pick out two particular functions that seem to me to be very important. Um, the first concerns the p panel we had on trauma. Um, and um, we heard from Professor Blackens quite rightly um, that trauma is a, is a psychiatric concept uh, which has now been applied uh, to political and social, uh, political and social contexts, perhaps not always very critically. But it does seem to me that one of the important things about remembrance, about these things that we're trying to remember here, of course, is that, that many people still seek some kind of closure. In other words, if you were sitting on the, in the, on the psychiatrist's couch, at the, at the end point, once the trauma had been drawn out of you, once, once you'd gone through that process, of cleansing and so on, that you do have a sense of closure. And I think for many Europeans who were caught up in the maelstrom of war and totalitarianism, closure is a very important thing. And I, I want to give a couple, just a couple of examples to show what I mean. I was very privileged last year uh, in, in Tallinn to uh, attend the unveiling of the monument to the victims of communism. It was a very moving ceremony, a very moving moving day, but that, that, that clearly was a very important monument. It had all the names on of the victims um, from, well, from the, the first Soviet occupation in 1930, so 1940 onwards. Uh, and it's a place where people could now go, where they leave flowers, where they find names of, uh, of their family, their, their, their parents, their grandparents, or whatever, the people who suffered as a result of, uh, of communist terror. Uh, and I think those sorts of monuments are very important. It is about remembrance, but it's also about closure. Another example I want to use is a few years ago, I went to the Jewish Museum in Prague with uh, an elderly Jewish friend who passed away last year, age 100. He managed to escape from Slovakia shortly before the outbreak of the Second World War. The rest of his family didn't. They all died, uh, the entire extended family. And when we went, if any, any, if any of you know the Jewish Museum in Prague, they have all the names inscribed in metal all the way around in the opening rooms. It's again a very moving place. And he went steadily around village by village, if done by village by village, uh, picking out all the names of, uh, of his family. And he hadn't done that or been able to do that at any point uh, beforehand and did it in his late 80s. And I, I thought that too was an interesting example uh, of closure, important for him. Um, now that's one of the things I think remembrance does and should do. And it will continue to do as more monuments are built uh, 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 and as we discover more about the nature of uh, the victims. The second thing it seems to me that remembrance does is to educate. 
And I was very, very struck, as I think one of the speakers has said uh, today, very struck uh, on the afternoon of, of Monday, the turbo presentations, very struck by the extraordinary range uh, of uh, projects which are really dedicated to educating people about the things I, I, I've just talked about, totalitarianism, war and genocide. Um, uh, uh, and this is aimed at the young generation, and many of the people running these projects are themselves young. Um, and I do think in, in terms of remembrance, and indeed in terms of what this project network does, this is a critical factor. It is essential to educate people. Um, now, uh, Professor Del Sol told us on, uh, or yesterday, I think about, about en the enemy, about uh, um, uh, us and the other. Uh, and I want to come back to the idea of enemy, because I think there are enemies, um, which is why education is so important. And those enemies are ethnic and religious uh, intolerance, uh, xenophobia, authoritarianism, a willingness to resort to violence. Those are the enemies uh, that we still face. Those are the enemies that this network is attempting to confront. And one of the educative functions of this network and of the networks we heard about on Monday afternoon is to ensure that a generation of Europeans grows up knowing what the consequences and costs of war are, knowing what the end product of racial hatred is, knowing in the end uh, the cost of intolerance and violence. And again, just one more example. I went to the Shoah exhibition yesterday, as uh, many of you did. Um, uh, and the educative power of the Shoah Memorial is, I think, quite extraordinary. That room at the end where they have the pictures of all the children who were deported from France to their deaths in uh, Auschwitz is a deeply moving experience. But it's, it's an educative experience. You go there and, and you, are, you are immediately confronted with what the end product of racial hatred actually is. Now those two things, um, closure and education, seem to me to be two very important elements of what the network here is involved with. The final thing I want to say is solidarity. I mean, when I first uh, came to, to address the conference of, of, the, of the network, I was, I was a bit puzzled about what solidarity meant. Um, and I think from my opening remarks about the problems of constructing a European, common European memory, the solidarity is an aspiration. Um, I think one of the things that was perhaps missing from the conference here given that the Soviet Union and Germany had such a key part to play in the three things we're talking about, war, totalitarianism, and genocide, is that it would be good to see greater involvement from German historians and, and political scientists, and indeed the presence of Russians here too, uh, because here are two paths that are difficult to confront. Here, here are the two, if you like, main perpetrators of the things that we're talking about. And, and, and if we're going to establish solidarity, it's got to be solidarity that involves uh, the two major powers that were responsible uh, for much of what it is this network deals with. Um, but it is an aspiration, I think, rather than anything else. It's an aspiration to find ways of reconciling those very different narratives, while at the same time being very honest about their diversity. Uh, it's an aspiration, I think, to find shared values in the way in which we interpret Europe's recent past. It's an aspiration, I think, to try and find shared values about the way in which we treat the Europe of the present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Thank you, Professor Overy. At the end, before the lunch, I would like to thank all of you for being with us, to, with uh, all uh, our um, partners, with all um, speakers, uh, to being active, to share your opinions, to share your uh, doubts and uh, differences. I hope it, it will be useful for you and for your work, and I hope we will meet next year in Tallinn, you are invited already there. We will inform you, hopefully shortly, about the date. But it will be probably 
uh, May next year. Thank you very much once more, and I would like to thank once more Maria Naimska and the team of DNRS for organizing this meeting. Thank you.